Because if this is what happens in young type one healthy diabetic children, what does this mean for adults that have had long standing type one diabetes with higher A1Cs and fluctuating blood sugar levels, along with a host of everything else that you're dealing with, insulin resistance, PCOS, Hashimoto's. <laughs>
But as soon as I started to implement more rest breaks in between my workouts, I noticed that I was actually feeling stronger when I went back to do another upper body workout or lower body workout that required large muscle groups. And I was able to lift more, more progressive overload, which is key for muscle growth. And I felt like I had, again, more energy overall. So when we consider rest for a non-diabetic, maybe that their bodies are healing within that 24 hour mark. But for us, maybe we need a little bit longer than that. Maybe your body responds better to having two days rest in between very large muscle groups. Consider a chest, tricep, shoulder day, and then somebody that went and just did a back and bicep day the next day, you might feel more depleted than if you had a rest day in between there and then did your push, your pull day after that. Also, what we have to consider, guys, is resting in between your sets. Another way that we can maximize type one specific training. So what we have to understand with resting in between sets, the reason why we do that, I, you've probably seen, hey, I'm resting 60 seconds in between my intervals or 90 seconds or one minute, three minutes, but why are you doing that? The idea is that you feel like you have a little bit more energy to catch your breath. Many people don't know the reason you're doing that is to recharge your battery from a perspective of what's called ATP. When we recharge our batteries, this allows us to go and push heavier weight the next time for the next set. Now, what we're finding with type one diabetics, the research is showing us that a type one diabetic is having a harder time recharging ATP from ADP. So what that means is ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. This is your body's energy pack. Now, to recharge 90% of your ATP after, let's say you do one set, you can't lift that weight up anymore, so we drop the weight, now we need to rest. Your body in that rest time is recharging ATP energy. Now, typical rest breaks are gonna be about three minutes to recharge ATP around 90%, generally speaking. Now, for a type one diabetic, this process can take a little bit longer. Even studies are showing us in children, it can take them longer to recharge ATP that are healthy, or their body taking longer to recharge ATP. And we have to understand how our bodies are set up because our bodies are set up a little bit different in how we use energy, this can get in the way. And just like we talked about what's called oxidative phosphorylation, where our bodies take glucose, take fats, they can use that and convert to ATP and energy. We can have issues within our mitochondria where this process takes place when it comes to creating this ATP. So as a result, the process is either backlogged or slowed down, in which case it might take us a little bit longer than three minutes to recharge 90%. In the studies, maybe for to three minutes, it might take three minutes and 30 seconds to recharge in the same way as a non-diabetic. Essentially, it's like getting a charger that's a little bit worn out, but we're still using it. It can charge, but it's not charging optimally. So charging optimally might mean for you testing it out and seeing how does an extra 30 seconds work for you? How do you feel with your workouts over time? And a lot of times it's over time as well. What does this mean over time for how much weight you've increased? Are you progressively overloading better, more efficiently? Hey, Tet Lee, how's it going, buddy? That's a key thing for us to understand is the rest in between sets. Just as much as we consider the rest post-workout as well and whether that might be something that's important for you to add in. Because if this is what happens in young type one healthy diabetic children, what does this mean for adults that have had long standing type one diabetes with higher A1Cs and fluctuating blood sugar levels, along with a host of everything else that you're dealing with, insulin resistance, PCOS, Hashimoto's, maybe low iron, other details that happen to type one diabetics. So we have to consider how do we optimize for you. I love you, buddy. Now, the biggest thing I wanna to say too is this, this doesn't mean that you have to wait this long. It doesn't mean that you still can't get results. But for some people that might be hitting in, hit, getting into walls, feeling low on energy, this could be something to try and see how you feel. I know for me, giving myself a rest day in between really helped me out. Now for me, what I'll do is I do a lot of superset training and that brings us into our next topic, but I will go and do a set of let's say bench press and then I'll do a set of tricep extensions and shoulder flies. Then I'll rest for an extended period of time, three minutes and 30 seconds but I'll still do supersets before I rest. That really helps me to maximize my fullness over time of how I felt when I was training and the size that I have on. Now, volume itself is also key for us and, and how we can trigger what's called local IGF-1. Now, what we have to understand for type one diabetics is your body does not produce the same amount of serum IGF-1. Serum IGF-1 is almost like the muscle building equivalent of a basal rate. Serum IGF-1 gets released from the liver and that in response to growth hormone and insulin. Now, 
with that release, it can help in the background to keep uh, proteins optimized to keep muscle more intact. Now in type one diabetics, because we have more insulin resistance, the insulin is no longer coming from the pancreas, going directly to the portal vein and then to the liver. And as a result, we have a little bit more growth hormone resistance at the liver. It's not triggering this release of IGF-1 as well as it should. So as a result, now we, we don't get the same impact of that serum IGF-1. But we have to note as well with, with IGF-1, your body also produces local IGF-1. Local IGF-1, so I got local, IGF-1 is this IGF-1, like mechanical growth factor, that comes directly from the muscles. And this happens when you stimulate muscle growth through things like resistance training mainly, is gonna really maximize that muscle growth. So if you're someone who's a type one and considering, what do I need to do to maximize muscle growth or burn more body fat? Focusing on muscle growth and resistance training is really gonna help to take that to the next level for you. Also training to failure, really stressing those muscles can produce a little bit more local IGF-1. Rather than someone that's using more of the aerobic system and they're, they're hitting 15, 20 reps they, uh, and they're not going till failure, you're not really maximizing that development. So you want to, a sweet spot that I like is between about eight to 12 reps. Now to increase volume there, I might do a drop set. So a drop set means I'm gonna do uh, maybe bicep curls and then I'm gonna do lighter weight at about 50% and go till another eight, another six to eight reps till failure. And then I'm gonna rest. Already I've increased my volume from the next person who's just doing a regular bicep curl and then resting for three minutes, three minutes, 30 seconds, and then redoing it again or 90 seconds. So for me, over time, I'm getting double the amount of reps, double the amount of volume in than your average person who's going to the gym and not doing that. I would say for me, this is the single most powerful thing that I've kept, have one, helped me to develop a little bit more muscle in terms of increasing my volume, increasing my intensity with my workouts as well, and getting my body in motion. For type ones, getting the body in motion can help to improve insulin sensitivity. So it's one of the reasons why in between some of my sets, I might do a lap around the gym, or I might just go and just have my machine spread out so I'm moving from place to place to get more steps in. For us, a lot easier for us to retain more body fat due to how we take insulin. We can become more insulin resistant easier because of how we take insulin. Motion and movement can help us to become more sensitive, just as building muscle does because 90% of glucose disposal happens in the muscle. So these are key things that we can think about just as a baseline for how our bodies might be slightly different and things that we could test in order to see how do we feel over time? Are we increasing strength? Are we increasing energy? How do we feel with the muscle development that we have? How do we feel with fat burning? Because again, remember, the more muscle we are developing, the more of a furnace capacity you have to, to put the fat in to burn it, the more wood that would go in the furnace to burn it. So we gotta think about building muscle if we also wanna think about fat burning, but also optimizing our health.